Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this morning's live stream from uh, Christchurch Harborough. Uh, my name is Richard Underwood. I'm one of the leaders of the church, and it's my uh, pleasure and privilege to be uh, leading us uh, through this morning's time of worship. I'm sure you uh, are aware of just how deeply grateful we are to uh, Adrian and to John, to Johnny, for all the ways that they've uh, <coughs> supported us and served us through our live streams over the last uh, three months. And uh, we really want to give them um, a bit of a breather over the uh, summer. So it's Roy and I who uh, are in charge. If I were you, I would definitely get praying. We're very glad too for um, Isabel and Oliver who are kind of helping and supporting us through these uh, morning live streams. So thanks, Isabel, for all you're doing um, this morning. Uh, over the next uh, few weeks, the services will feel slightly different. They'll be a little shorter. They'll be kind of stripped down. But if they are slightly time short, we hope that they're going to be gospel rich. Well, we want to meet the Lord Jesus, and we're so grateful that by his Holy Spirit, uh, he's here with us today, uh, here with you, wherever you are, here with me, um, here in uh, this place. And uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at the language of lament. The last few uh, months have been in intensely difficult, and the Bible gives us language in order to sing in a minor key. Uh, so we're going to be thinking about that this morning and uh, next week we'll be more reverting to type as we learn how to sing uh, in a major key. Uh, why don't we uh, begin our time by praying and then we're going to sing together. Uh, Father God, we're so glad to be here in your presence uh, this morning. Thank you for the sun that's shining, but the sun that we long to see is the, the sunshine of your love radiating down from heaven and beaming into our hearts and warming us and nourishing us and just reminding us how blessed we are to be loved by this great and marvellous God. We pray, Father God, that by your spirit you would stir our hearts to love you and to worship you, to express our devotion to you. And we pray that as we do that, you would come and move us and uh, come and draw us to yourself. Uh, Father, these are very strange times and this is a strange way of being, church. But we pray, Lord God, that you cut through all of that and minister to each of us according to our needs. Father, we have sins that need to be forgiven. Please wash us afresh in the blood of the Lord Jesus. We have doubts that assail us. Please would you come and just uh, restore us and renew us and uh, encourage us this morning. Maybe we feel weak, come and strengthen us. Maybe we feel empty, come and fill us, we ask. Uh, Father, we pray that we would be blessed by this time together. But even more than that, we want you to be blessed. Uh, we want you to be really pleased as, we, as you see your children just uh, lifting their hearts and their voices to you today. So would you help us in all of this, we ask. And we pray it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, sing together um, a, uh, a song that just reflects on some uh, words that uh, God speaks in the book of Job. We're going to be coming back to those in just a moment or two with the children. So why don't you stand wherever you are and be ready to sing God's praise together as we sing Who Has Held the Oceans in His Hands. When you hear the music... Get up and sing. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God seated on his throne. Come let us adore him. Behold our King. Nothing can compare. Come let us adore Oh, him, he 
appearance from um, Adrian this morning who's uh, helping us with his sing uh, with our singing. Thank you so much um, Adrian. Now I'm delighted to have uh, Pippa, uh, my wife uh, here, helping me um, this morning and uh, I've got a little test question for you. Um, I want you to see if you can finish this sentence. Um, it's one of our grandchildren's favourite sayings uh, to give you a little clue the first part's going to pop up on the screen and it says it's not and what do you think the answer would be? Fair. It's not fair. Oh, OK. Well, I want to tell you the story of a man <clears throat> who said it's not fair. Uh, only he said it to uh, God. Uh, we might even have um, a picture of him. Now, listen, this is going to be very testing because, um, well, I, I don't know what you make of the, uh, the drawings. Um, I, I am available to do commissions for, um, for anybody who, who finds the artwork irresistible. But uh, here's a picture of this man. His name is uh, Job. Long ago in the land of Uz, there lived this man called Job. He was a good man. He loved God. He refused to do wrong. He was honourable and he was rich. Uh, he had thousands of uh, sheep down the bottom and camels and oxen and donkeys and servants. But best of all, he had ten lovely children. Job was the greatest man in the land and everything in his life was going along nicely. Meanwhile, up in heaven, someone had spotted Job. We call him Satan. He complained to God, Job doesn't love you, not really, he, he only says he does because of all the good things you keep giving him. Take all those blessings away and he will curse you, he'll spit in your face, you see. Amazingly, God told Satan to do what he wanted, but on one condition he was not to harm Job. Satan slunk out of God's presence. He was already developing, devising a devilish plan to make Job turn against God. One day, a servant ran up to Job, breathless with some devastating news. Uh, all your oxen and, and all your donkeys, they've been stolen by raiders and, and worst of all, your servants have been killed. And just as Job was taking in this terrible news, Another servant came running up. A huge fire has swept through the pasture land. It's wiped out all your sheep and killed your servants. Even as he was speaking, another servant came running up. Our enemies of uh, invaders have uh, ambushed your camel train. They've stolen your camels and killed your servants. But the worst was yet to come. Even as the last servant was speaking, another servant ran up with the most devastating news of all. 
Job, your children were having a party and a terrible wind blew up and has destroyed their marquee and your children, they're, they're all dead. In an instant, Job had lost everything, his wealth and his family. They were all gone. And remember, he, <clears throat> he didn't deserve any of this. His grief was unbearable. He tore his clothes, he shaved his head, he fell to the ground. Satan rubbed his hands with glee. This was it. Job was about to curse God. But instead, Job worshipped God. The Lord gave me all these things, and the Lord has taken them all away. I'm still going to bless the name of the Lord, he said. Satan was furious. He was sure Job would curse God. So he asked God if he could try again. Make Job sick. Scarily, God said, yes, and gave him permission to continue with his evil plan. But on the condition that he was not allowed to take Job's life. This time, Job broke out in horrible sores. They covered his entire body. He was so itchy, he used the sharp edges of a broken pot to scratch his sores. He was very ill and incredibly unhappy but he still worshipped God. His wife was no help at all. Just curse God and die, she snarled. Even his friends were no help. They all tried to advise him and tell him what to do. But instead of comforting him and praying with him, they criticised him. To them it was obvious. God was just, life was fair, so Job must have done something terrible for God to punish him like this. They even came up with lists of sins he must have committed. Through all of this, Job defended his innocence. But he did start to lose heart. He just couldn't understand why, why, what God was up to. He hadn't done all those wicked things his, his friends were talking about, so why would God allow these terrible things to happen to him? He even accused God. God, it's not fair. God, you're not fair. Finally, he demanded that God should come and explain himself. So God did come. He came in the form of a great storm. He didn't tell God, uh, Job about Satan's evil plan. Instead, he took Job on a virtual tour of the universe. He explained that as God, he was the one who brought everything into existence, including Job. As God, no one could question him when life didn't seem to make sense to them. Uh, from Job's point of view, God was being very unfair. But all Job knew how to do was to think about sheep and camels and donkeys and kids. God had an entire universe to think about. He was thinking about mountains to make and uh, oceans to fill and stars to throw into space. That's what God calls his wisdom. And God knew something else that Job didn't. He knew that one day he was going to step into this world in the person of his son who was going to die on a cross to put an end to Satan and all his devilish schemes and to rescue us from all the wrong things we do and all the daft things we think. Job gradually came to see that a human being asking God to defend himself was absurd and he responded in the only way he could. He repented and worshipped God. Satan's plan had failed. Eventually he gave up and Job's sufferings came to an end. He never did understand why all those terrible things happened to him, but, but he did know that God was good and God could be trusted and he learned to live in peace with that. Wonderfully, God healed Job and gave him back everything he'd lost. He blessed Job with even more wealth and even more possessions and, scarily, even more children. Job lived until he was 140 years old. And the end of his life was even better than the beginning. Was the uh, return of all these good things a kind of reward? Congratulations, Job, you passed the test. No, Job losing all those things in the first place wasn't a punishment. And Job getting them all back again wasn't a reward. It was just a gift from a God who's good and a God we can trust. We may think uh, that life's not uh, fair, 
just now. It's not fair that we weren't able to go to school for most of last term. It's not fair that we haven't been able to go out properly with our friends. It's not fair that we haven't had a hug from Grandma or Grandad. It's not fair that we may not be able to go where we want to go on holiday this summer. But when we think about the cross of the Lord Jesus, we remember that God is good and that God can be trusted. And that's why we're here, worshipping him today. And our next song tells us what happens when God sends the Lord Jesus, his son, into the world. It's bound to make us sit up and listen. So, boys and girls, don't forget to shout when the time comes. Let's stand and sing. favourite children's songs. Um, I hope that blessed uh, you. Now we're going to think about praying together. How do you think we could do that? Okay, so I have got uh, some reminders for us here. We're going to think about three things that we should do when we pray. Um, first of all, we need to think about some of the things that we can thank God for. That's the T. That's the T. Then for the S, we need to think about some of the things that we need to say sorry for. And then finally, the P is where we think about some of the things that we can say please for. So they're the things that we're asking for, people we're asking um, God's blessing on particularly, things like that. And that's the pattern we're going to follow right now. Mm. So, why don't you at home just take a moment to think about some T's, things to say thank you for, and then I'm going to pray. Uh, Father God, sometimes it's hard to think of things to say thank you for, and maybe now is one of those times when it's easy to think of all the things that aren't quite going right, but Father God, even in these times, there's still so many things to say thank you for. Thank you for our health. Thank you for our families. Thank you for our food. Thank you for our lovely homes. Thank you for this beautiful part of the country you've uh, placed us in. 
But Father God, thank you especially that you are still with us. Thank you that you are still the God you are, big and powerful and loving and kind. And thank you, Father God, that you are still the God and Father of our dear Lord Jesus. Thank you that we can praise you and bless you, that the Lord Jesus has died for us on the cross so that we can be forgiven and so that Satan can be defeated. Thank you too for your lovely Holy Spirit, kind of God who's living inside us. And uh, we want to ask you, Holy Spirit, to just make God really real and really precious and fill our hearts with love. So there are lots of things to say thank you for, even this morning. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to think about some of the things that we should be saying sorry for. Dear Lord, we do thank you so much that we can come into your presence. We are um, like uh, sheep who have gone astray. We have turned to our own ways and we have not followed your ways. And Lord, we are truly sorry for the way we live our lives day by day, so often not giving you more than a passing thought, if that. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us that we uh, do not love you as we should and we do not uh, do those things which uh, bring glory to your name. And we are truly sorry, Father. We um, want to repent. We want to turn our back on those things, say that we're sorry, and we want to ask for your help to do better today. Uh, Lord, we know that there are uh, many times over the last few months when we may have uh, said or thought it's not fair and Lord we don't want to be like Job uh, we want to be people who always trust you to have our best interests at heart because Lord we know deep down that that's the case so forgive us for saying it's not fair forgive us Lord for all the things that we have done even in the last uh, few uh, days uh, that have not brought glory to you. Forgive us, Lord, for not doing the things that we should have done. And will you help us to be truly sorry for all these things? And we ask this for the sake of the Lord Jesus, who died so that we could have forgiveness. Amen. Mm. Well, we've done a T and S. Just take a moment to think about something you might like, some things you might like to say please for as we come to God in prayer. Father God, there are so many things that we need just at this time. And thank you that you encourage us in the Bible to come and say please to you. Father, we want to bring this whole horrid COVID-19 situation to you this morning. We want to say please, please would you help the government as they are trying to navigate the really difficult, this really difficult time. Help them to make wise decisions and to give us clear advice on what is the best way forward. Please, would you help the scientists who are trying to understand how this virus works and are trying to come up with a vaccine that can kind of rescue us from it. Please, would you be with people who are worried today, worried maybe about their work, worried about their money. Uh, please, would you be with people who are feeling very sad today, sad because they've lost members of their families as a result of this terrible disease. Father God, there are so many things we need to say please for. But above all, please would you help us to be loving, warm-hearted, confident followers of the Lord Jesus, who are able to share the good news about him with our family, with our friends, with our neighbours, with our mates. Please, in all these things, help us, Father God, we ask. Amen. Amen. Brilliant. OK, um, we're now going to um, listen to the Bible being read to us, and uh, Pippa's going to do that from Psalm 13. Psalm 13, starting at verse 1. This is for the director of music and is a psalm of David. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long 
will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death, and my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Well, thanks to Pepper for um, helping me uh, with that and for um, being with me um, this morning. We're going to look at that uh, psalm uh, together now. Uh, let me just pray because uh, I need God's help to uh, preach to you and you need God's help to listen. So, Father, we do thank you that we can come <clears throat> to you this morning. We've prayed to you. We've sung your praise. We thank you for your presence. And now we ask that you would speak to us through your word. Thank you that you are a father who loves us, who understands us perfectly, and who wants us to know how to live through these difficult days. So please help us to have warm hearts and, and open ears and ready minds and soft wills so that you can come and impress upon us the things that you want to say to us today. We want to come away from this morning loving you more. So would you help us now, we ask. Amen. Well, there was a, a famous 19th century Prime Minister called Benjamin Disraeli. He uh, famously gave this instruction, never complain, never complain. And uh, many of us have made that our motto ever since, whether it's a trivial matter like the X7 bus running late down to Northampton in the morning or something much more serious like a, a life-changing diagnosis. We just stiffen our upper lips and press on stoically. Never complain. But is that the right attitude? Well, I think about the Apostle Paul's injunction to his friends in Philippi, do everything without grumbling or arguing. So never complain sounds like a pretty appropriate motto. And yet, and yet, do you know, we step into this world with a cry that the first sound we, we make as we emerge from the warm, protective environs of our mum's womb is, is a loud protest. And the protest doesn't stop at birth. It continues right through to old age, as I'm discovering. We, we protest because the world out there is broken. And we protest because sometimes it feels like the world in here is broken too. So how does a world in which tears and sorrow are part of our common human experience fit with my motto, never complain? Well, frankly, it doesn't. Never complain simply doesn't work. I, I don't want to be a, a moaning mini, or in my case, a grumbling old Grinch, but my heart simply longs sometimes for the freedom to sing in a minor key. I long to recapture the lost language of lament. Let's take a step back for a moment and, and ask the obvious question, what is lament? Well, it's not the same as crying, in the kind of way that groaning is not the same as moaning. That there's something distinctly, uniquely Christian about lament. Think back to our friend Job. He may have been a contemporary of Abraham. It's probable that his story is one of the earliest stories ever recorded in the Bible. What do you make of this? Oh, that I might have my request, that God would grant me what I hope for. Well, I've prayed that kind of prayer many times, but I've never prayed this. That God would be willing to crush me, to let loose his hand and cut off my life. Gosh, that's pretty raw. And if Job reveals the depth of individual sorrow, then the book of Lamentations expresses the sorrow of a whole nation as it weeps over the destruction of Jerusalem. If you were an Old Testament Jew, that would be the end of the world for you. No wonder the exiles ask that haunting questions uh, by the rivers of Babylon. How can we sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? 
So lament is more than crying, it's a form of praying. It's more than expressing our sorrow or venting our emotion. Lament is turning to God and pouring out our fears and our frustrations and our confusion when life doesn't seem to make sense and he doesn't seem to be fair. What is lament? We can define it like this. Prayer in pain that leads to trust in God. Prayer in pain that leads to trust in God. Notice the direction of travel. Lament is leading somewhere. Lament is not hankering for the past. That was Israel moaning in the wilderness, longing to get back to all the good things of Egypt. Ha ha. No, lament is hungering for the future, longing for the promised land. Lament is yearning for the brokenness to be healed and beauty to be restored, for the darkness to be lifted and for the light to shine again for the curse to be rolled back and life to flourish again. Lament is vocalising that deepest longing for a better day to dawn. Lament is a healthy sign that actually we are homesick for heaven. Now I say all this by way of introduction to the psalm that Pippa read to us, Psalm 13. Did you know that over a third of the psalms are songs of lament? Well, Psalm 13 is a great example. It is a good place to bring our pain because it challenges the philosophy that we should never complain. It illustrates four essential elements of lament. Here they are. Turning. Groaning. Asking. Trusting. Now, of course, we don't experience them all quite as neatly as that, but let's think about them in turn. Turning, first of all. Lament begins with turning consciously to God. Look at verse 1. How long, Lord? The Holy Spirit has graciously included these words in the Bible to show how we should respond to the trials of life. When pain creates struggles and poses hard questions, God wants us to talk to him about them, even if it's messy and awkward and embarrassing. Being frank with God is so much better than just faking it and pretending that all is well. God isn't the kind of father who tells his kids to shut up at the moment they open their mouths. No, he invites us to share what's on our hearts openly, honestly. I can imagine some of our non-Christian friends being rather nonplussed by this. You can't talk to God like that. To which I guess the reply goes something like this. What kind of fantastic father do you think allows his children the freedom to talk to him like this? That's turning. Then there's groaning. I love this. Lament throws open the door to heaven's complaints department. Now, I don't want you to look at your Bibles. I want you to close your eyes and listen. Listen to this. How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Okay, you can open your eyes now. But notice how different this complaint is from the the Israelites moaning in the wilderness. They were complaining in the hearing of God. David isn't complaining about God, he's complaining to God. Did you feel the intensity of his protest? How long, how long, how long, how long? Not twice, not thrice, but four times. But lament is more than just rehearsing our angst. Lament is humbly, honestly identifying our pain, asking the hard questions, expressing the doubts, the fears, the frustrations, raging in our souls. Listen again. Will you forget me forever? Will you hide your face from me? Gosh, that's kind of poignant, isn't it? In a day when we're all going around hiding our faces from one another. Must I wrestle with my thoughts? Must I have sorrow in my heart? Will my enemy triumph over me? The questions just keep coming. And they are as sharp as daggers. But here's the point. 
this kind of prayer only makes sense when God is a good God. There's no point pouring out your heart like this to someone who's a tyrant who couldn't care less. You see, there's grace in this minor key. As we get honest with God, lament gives us the opportunity to ask him the gutsy questions about why he seems to be ignoring our pain and our sorrow. David's situation here in Psalm 13 sounds desperate and his heart is anguished. So we're not surprised that his language is rough and it's raw. This is life as he's experiencing it just now. And here's the problem. He knows that somehow God is involved in this. It just doesn't seem right. And in stirring David's heart to pen the words of Psalm 13, Father God is reaching out to him. OK, David, when that's how you feel, this is what you should say. Now, again, our non-Christian friends may be a bit sceptical. I thought you Christians weren't supposed to have doubts. If only. God knows that in a broken world we're not immune from the pain and the suffering, the, the questions they rise in our hearts. Like Job, we can't see the end from the beginning. But we know someone who can. And that's why we turn. And that's why we groan. And that's why we ask in the third place. Asking. Seeking God's help while we're racked by doubts is a remarkable act of faith. Listen to this from verse 3. Look on me and answer me, Lord my God. There's great danger in unremitting sorrow. Unremitting sorrow can create a kind of deadly silence in our souls in which we either give in to despair, well what's the point? Or we give in to denial, everything's fine honestly. Lament doesn't do either of those things. It invites God to come and help us. Look again at verse 3. Look on me and answer me, Lord my God. Like, I don't want to be rude, Lord, but remember who you are. You're not just God. You're Lord my God. You've entered into a covenant with me. You've got a duty of care towards me. You've made these spectacular promises to me. Lord, you've got to help me. And notice what it is that David asked God to do. Give light to my eyes. What an enigmatic phrase that is. Give light to my eyes. It, it's kind of Hebrew shorthand for come and restore me, Lord. Come and give me my life back. Come and put a sparkle in my eyes and a, a spring back in my step and a colours back in my cheeks. Interestingly, David's not asking God to change his circumstances. He's asking God to change him. Help him to come to terms with what's going on, to have a new perspective on his circumstances. Turning, groaning, asking. And then fourthly, trusting. Pain creates disappointment. Lament provides the language that dares to hope again. It's not a cul-de-sac of despair, it's a conduit for renewed faith. I mentioned the book of Lamentations a bit earlier. It seems instructive to me that pretty much the only bit of Lamentations that, that most of us Western Christians know is the sudden appearance of hope in verse 3. It's printed on tea towels in Christian kitchens across the nation. Listen to this from the New Living Translation. <clears throat> the thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. Did you notice the kind of pivotal moment? Yet I still dare to hope. Now, grab on that daring to hope bit and uh, drag it back into Psalm 13, will you? 
Because even the question how long suggests that there's some kind of end in sight. This horrible situation, whatever it is, it isn't the end of the story. It won't have the last word. So a psalm that begins by asking why God seems so far away ends with this statement of renewed confidence in verse 5. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. After the visceral agony of verses 1 to 4, the melody modulates from a minor to a major key in verses 5 and 6. Isn't that the point of lament? A prayer in pain that leads to trust in God. Well, that's David. What, what about us? How can we enter into Psalm 13? Well, as John and Johnny have so helpfully reminded us over the recent weeks, the book of Psalms is really Jesus' songbook. This psalm is his psalm. Look at it again. Can you imagine him praying verses 1 to 4? As Roman soldiers drive rough nails through his hands and his feet and... Jewish elders stand by and sneer. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will my enemy triumph over me? It's not for nothing that Jesus is described as the man of sorrows as he steps out of heaven into the chaos of our fallen world. He agonises at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. He weeps over his beloved Jerusalem. Supremely he cries out from the cross as he takes the weight of our sin on his shoulders. My God, my God, why have you, you of all people, forsaken me? My God, my God, why? It's a cry of anguish drawn straight from the Psalms of Lament. Not Psalm 13 as it happens, but Psalm 22, a psalm that reaches its climax like this. Future generations will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. He has done it. What is that, if not an anticipation of Jesus' cry of triumph from the cross? It is finished. I have done it. And what is this? If it isn't lament doing its perfect work, a prayer in pain that leads to trust in God. With that he breathed his last and gave up his spirit. We need the language of lament just now as we take in the devastation that COVID-19 has wrought across our world. We need to be real about our suffering and our sorrow, our doubts and our fears. We need to be honest about all the grief and the brokenness. And we need to be able to do this without feeling like we're failures or second-rate Christians or we shouldn't be thinking like this. Brokenness is not a sign of failure. Sadness is not a denial of the gospel. Tears are not incompatible with joy in the Lord. Lament helps us to see where we are in the story, in a world that was made so good and yet is now broken and deeply messed up. It sees our world through the lens of the gospel. We know that God is sovereign and God is good. We know his promises in the scriptures. We know that the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive. We know that a better world is coming and that is precisely why we groan. We're longing for the end of all our lament. Prayer in pain that leads to trust in God. Listen to these words from the epilogue of Elizabeth Elliot's classic book, Through Gates of Splendour. But the book tells the story of uh, five young missionaries who were savagely killed while trying to reach the Orca Indians of Ecuador. One of those brave young men was Elizabeth's husband, Jim. She writes these words, God is God. If he is God, he is worthy of my worship and of my service. I will find rest nowhere but in his will. And listen to this. That will is infinitely, immeasurably, unspeakably beyond my largest notions of what he is up to. 
His will is infinitely, immeasurably, unspeakably beyond my largest notions of what he's up to. If Job ever got to read those words, he'd leap up with joy. At last, somebody understands. Yes, grief is horrible. It's natural that we should want to fix it now. But Elizabeth Elliot's right. We haven't got a clue what God's up to. What lament does is to create the space that helps us to be a bit more thoughtful, a bit more reflective a bit more humble. And now in this moment, we need lament. We need to sing in a minor key. Lament works its way out in a number of uh, ways. It, first of all, it grounds our personal devotions. That uh, TSP prayer it is a good model for praying, but sometimes it just doesn't quite fit. Sometimes we just need the freedom to cry out, Don't you feel my pain, Lord? Be honest. Tell him about your trials, your troubles, your sufferings, your sorrows, your doubts, your fears. He can take it. Talking to him like this is not an act of folly, it's an act of faith. Lament informs our pastoral conversations. As we weep with those who weep, it's no good telling people to read Romans 8.28 and get over it. No, God's given us words to use. Tell me, how does it feel to be you just now? What would Psalm 13 sound like if you were praying it today? In the midst of their grief, let's help our friends to turn, to groan, to ask, to trust. Lament informs our pastoral conversations. It deepens our intercessory praying as we reflect together on world issues and health issues and family issues. We become more outward looking as uh, the pain of a broken world out there is brought to our loving Heavenly Father in here. Lament deepens our intercessory praying. And, and then maybe uh, counterintuitively, lament lends authenticity to our witnessing. As we seek to make sense of COVID-19 and racial inequality, it helps us to acknowledge that the world is broken and the life of faith is not a life of easy answers. Being a lead believer in the Lord Jesus doesn't exempt us from the trials and troubles of life. What it does is point us unerringly to one who is bringing about a better world to come. If you're watching this live stream this morning and you're not a Christian yet, or can I say, first of all, how wonderful it is to have you here? But can I ask, where do you turn in the midst of your sorrows? You, you live in the same broken world as me. You face the same pressures as me. You feel the same pain as me. Who is there in your life who is bigger and wiser and stronger to whom you can turn? to whom you can express your groans, to whom you can ask for help, in whom you can put your trust. Would you think about coming to a God who loves this broken world so much, who loves you so much, that he sent his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You could turn to him right now, He's just one prayer away. If you're not quite ready to do that yet, there are some resources on our website that might help you. The details will be on the screen at the end of our gathering. But if you're watching this morning and you are a Christian, take heart. The day is coming when the Lord Jesus will lift your weary head. He'll wipe your tear-stained eye and he'll do it all with nail-pierced hands. The day is coming when we will never complain again. In the meantime, let's not be afraid to mourn. Let's not be afraid to pay attention to what God's teaching us right now. To cry, that's human. To lament, 
That is profoundly Christian. Thank you so much for listening. Why don't we bring our sermon this morning to an end by kind of standing up and, and declaring those beautiful words from Psalm 13. They're um, on the screen, verses 5 and uh, 6. Let's uh, say them together, not timidly, but boldly and confidently. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Amen. Well, let's sing a song that I love and which picks up that theme beautifully. The Lord is my salvation. Let's uh, stand and sing as soon as we hear um, Adrian and the music.
say faithful in love. My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. Glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is our salvation. The Lord is our salvation. Well, thank you so much for joining our live stream this morning. Uh, I, I'd love to have uh, an appeal, but that's kind of slightly awkward to uh, organise when we're meeting virtually like this. But if you feel that God's been stirring you and uh, you just need to talk to someone and pray with someone, then please do get in contact with one of the elders because we would love to uh, talk to you and uh, pray uh, with you. Uh, we'd love it if you could join us for our prayer meeting this evening, which will take place uh, on Zoom, as it usually does, at 6 um, o'clock. Uh, we're moving into a holiday period now, so most of the um, normal uh, church events uh, won't be happening over the uh, week. If you're plugged into a home group, just check with your home group leaders what may or may not be happening uh, this week. But again, thanks so much for joining us. Why don't we just bring our time together to a close by uh, praying to uh, God together. Look on me and answer me, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes. Father, that is the prayer of our hearts. And as we feel weary um, and maybe worried uh, about the effects of COVID-19 and, and where all this is going next, please, Father God, would you come to us and would you draw us to yourself and would you put your strong arms around us and give us one of those hugs from heaven that just lets us know that you're in control and that you love us and care for us deeply. Please bring us to the